Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Coming up today on The Story. We arrived finally at our destination on the other side of India. And as we arrived, all the church leaders were on the platform waiting for us to come. They said, we sent you three telegrams. We asked you to come. And I said, well, I got nothing. I'm here because he asked me to come. They said, don't you know that the other preacher for this Bible class has died? He had a heart attack. He died. And we asked you to come and be the teacher. The Story. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, today we have part three of our conversation with Bill Forward. He's sharing his and his wife Glad's story as a couple, and what a story it is. We've heard how their love story began when they were teenagers, and how the Lord led them to be missionaries in India when they were in their early 20s. We also heard that it wasn't all smooth sailing for them on the mission field, as they went through the heartache of the death of their second child as a baby. Today, we'll pick up the story as they're still missionaries in India, and Bill shares about the remarkable ways that God uses them in ministry for his honour and glory. Once again, Bill is chatting with Eric Scadabo from his home on the Sunshine Coast. Well, Bill, looking back on your experiences in India, would it be safe to say that before you went, you had expectations of what life as a missionary would be like, but then when you got there, there were some unexpected twists and turns. Would that be safe to say? Yes, I guess you're absolutely right. Um, when we first arrived, we'd gone by boat, by the way. There were no mm-hmm. aircraft flying into India, and it was lovely to catch a, a ship from Brisbane and go through Singapore. We had a, a 24-hour stopover in Singapore, mm-hmm. which was a good introduction to Asia to a degree. We mm-hmm. were met by some folk there and they took us to a bazaar and we saw and heard and tasted and, and smelled all the different smells of an Asian place. And, and it was really interesting. And then we sailed on from there via Sri Lanka up to Mumbai, Bombay as it was at the time. Mm-hmm. And we were met there by missionaries who were expecting us to mm-hmm. come. Now, now, just a moment. Had you ever been yeah. out of Australia at that point? No. No. Wow. So you're just going out of the country, had no idea what life no in another idea. country was like. And looking back, we were a pair of kids, uh, very young people, but God had called us and that mm-hmm. was enough for us. We mm-hmm. were serving the living God and uh, our pathway f- would be directed by him. We constantly live with that in our mind. If in all of our ways we acknowledge God, then he will direct our path. So we arrived in Bombay mm-hmm. and were met by a missionary friend who said, yes, I'm asking you to preach tomorrow. So <laughs> I was... <laughs> wow, thrown in the deep end. Yeah, as, absolutely. And for me as a youngster, because I was so young, only 22 at the time, uh, I was taken to this church and there I had to stand and preach with a translator because uh, obviously I didn't know any local languages, mm-hmm. but uh, it was an amazing, I can still remember today the message I gave that, that first right? Sunday in wow. the church. And it was something that's special because it was my very first message. And then that evening, he said, well, we're having a gospel service in the evening. We expect people to come in. So you're to speak at that as well. Look, I want to say that God put a seal upon our going to India because that evening there were a number of people who became followers of Jesus. It was Mm. just an amazing confirmation to me Mm -hmm. that we are in the place that God wanted us to be. So from there, we took a train. We had to change a couple of times. And we came to our our base where we would be. We were with senior missionaries for a few months, the ones who had written that first letter saying mm-hmm. that they yep. needed to retire. And they helped us adjust. They uh, helped us with the culture. They helped us with language. And eventually they left and we continued to study the local language. We learned one called Marathi. It's not a big language in India. It's only 100 million people speak Marathi. Oh, out just 100 of the, million. Yeah, just a hundred million. And so that was the one that we were, it was suggested that we learn that. And Mm -hmm. we took the advice of our senior people. And so we spent time doing that. And at the end, uh, I mean, I had done 
quite well with it. Glad struggled a little bit because by this time our first daughter was born and and she was now busy with motherhood. But mm. I'd done quite well with the language study and, and keen. And I was thinking, what can I do? What can I do? When I got a phone call from, or not a phone call, I got a letter from one of our senior people in another place saying, I hear that you're an administrator. Look, it'll be great because I had been in, in an administration in the Brisbane City Council when I was a lad. Mm. And so like, she said, we would like you to take over a project of Bible courses. Uh, these are evangelistic courses which we will advertise on the radio. People will write in for them. They will then send in their lessons to be marked. And I thought, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. That's no, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So I hired a room and I bought some furniture and I set up this office and printed some of the courses off. And I thought, well, this is going to be fun. This is what I'm going to do. And this is going to be my missionary service. But just then, a senior person came to me. He was the one who had actually been my examiner in terms of my language study. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm visiting another part of India. Will you come with me just mm -hmm. to see what God's doing in another part? And I said, oh, I'd love to do that. I'll be Timothy. You're Paul. I'll be Timothy. Mm -hmm. I'll carry your bag because he's a, an older man. Uh -huh. And so we got in a little train and it took us a day to travel right across India. It was a um, steam train. It was slow. It stopped at every station. It was awful. But we arrived finally at our destination on the other side of India. And as we arrived, all the church leaders were on the platform waiting for us to come. We got down out of the train and they looked at us and they fell on their knees and gave thanks to God that we had arrived. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I've mm -hmm. never seen this before yeah. in my life. Mm -hmm. And then they looked at me and said, thank God you've come. And I, I looked behind me to see who they really were looking for. <laughs> and no, that was me. They looked at me. Thank God you've come. And I, I said, but, 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 but I've come with him. Then didn't you get our telegram? And I said, what telegram? I, I've not had any telegram from you. Huh. They said, we sent you three telegrams. We asked you to come. And I said, well, I got nothing. I'm here because <laughs> he asked me to come. <laughs> and I, I said, well, wh wh why? And they said, don't you know that the other preacher for this Bible class has died? He had a heart attack. He died. Oh. And we asked you to come and be the teacher. And they said, there are 300 elders sitting around waiting for you now to come. Oh, wow. Come and have a cup of coffee. And you are to speak three times, twice in the day and once in the night. The night will be gospel, but the two day sessions are Bible teaching sessions. And we've got five days of special meetings. Oh, my goodness. And here I was, a 24-year-old, yeah. suddenly dumped in the deep end to teach the Bible to these people, well, I tell you what, it was just unbelievably oh, wow. yeah. challenging. So my, I did one of these Nehemiah instant prayers up, every, <laughs> Lord, show me what to do, tell yeah. me what to do. And immediately it flooded my mind. I've got 10 teaching sessions. I've got five gospel services to take in this next week with these 300 church leaders here waiting for me to teach them and the other man, of course. Mm -hmm. He was a senior man. He's a, the, the well-respected person. I'm completely new to them all, and I'd never done anything like this before, and suddenly I have to teach these 300 people. Well, the Lord put it in my heart to teach First Corinthians of all things. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but still. That's what I did because mm -hmm. I had learned 1 Corinthians very well in Bible college because there are six evils in the church and there are four questions they ask the Apostle Paul. So there's my 10 sermons. So <laughs> I... Look, it was a, one of those lovely experiences when you realize it's not you, but it's mm. God who's doing it. Mm. And I stood up to speak to these elders. These were the church leaders of the area. I knew full well they had told me that what you teach them today, they're going to take to their group of churches, and each one of these had 10, 15 churches that they were ministering in. And so it'll be like a ripple effect and they'll go and teach what you teach them, they're going to do it. So that was 
a very interesting thing. But for me, suddenly I realized that me marking Emmaus courses or Bible study courses was not really what God wanted me to do. This is what God wanted me to do. Mm. And look, the sequel to that is I went back to that church 10 years later. Uh, the first time I went back to that church, they were having another series of leadership meetings and teaching. And they said to me as I walked up to them, they said, please don't teach us First Corinthians. We still remember what you taught us. So I said, no, I have other messages that I can also okay. give. So, so lesson but learned, it, we can move on. <laughs> we can move on. But mm-hmm. my moving on was that this was now to be my mi- main ministry mm-hmm. in a spiritual sense, that I would be now become an itinerant, fairly itinerant Bible teacher, mm-hmm. and I would go to these uh, not just individual churches, but these Bible classes they had during the summer months and uh, when they couldn't work in the fields and things like that. And so we got together. We had three days, five days, and then they'd put me on a train or a bus and I'd go to the next place and the same thing would happen again and again and again. For 20 days a month, I was doing that. And so the impact of that was that I was able to encourage to teach the leaders who then taught what I taught them, a Paul Timothy kind of thing, what I've taught you, you'll teach them, Mm -hmm. they'll Mm -hmm. teach others. And that became my major spiritual ministry. But in terms of my local ministry, we had a local church and I was obviously doing as much as I could there, but I was away Many of the times, poor Glad was at home with the children, but Mm -hmm. that was the wonderful support that she gave to me, uh, asking me to go or allowing me to go and Mm -hmm. while she looked after the children. But locally, uh, our missionary group had two leprosy hospitals. They also had two orphanages and then they had a little general hospital as well. So I ended up administering one of the leprosy hospitals and it was in the i suppose it was in the bigger city the the other small one was out in the village but where i was it was closer to the bigger town and so administering the leprosy hospital gave me great standing in the local community so that the government understood who I was and what Mm -hmm. I was doing. Uh, I was invited to become an advisor to the government on leprosy care. And so so this was a double barrel. My spiritual ministry was teaching the scriptures in these places, but my local ministry was this leprosy work where I was to administer this leprosy hospital. Mm -hmm. And even in the doing of that, we went through an interesting period where there was a transition from being a segregated community to becoming a genuine hospital where some surgery was done, where we would treat people until their leprosy was under control, then we'd send them home. In the past, people with leprosy were just literally segregated and kept away from the Mm -hmm. community. They're more or less like an asylum. But in those days, in my day, it all changed. And there was a program that the government had instituted, which we then took on board, and they asked us to do so. They called it SET, Survey, Educate, and Treat. And so we had to train some young lads, uh, about a dozen of them, to become, in their term, paramedic workers. They weren't doctors, they weren't fully qualified, but they were people who I could identify leprosy, they could educate people about leprosy, and then they could supervise the treatment of the people under the direction of a doctor. You're listening to The Story. Today, once again, Bill Forward is our guest. He's sharing about his and his wife Glad's time as missionaries in India and all the remarkable ways God used them in ministry. We'll hear more of their story and how their time in India came to an end when we return. The Story. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. 
Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax, and this is The Story. Once again, Eric Scadabo is chatting with Bill Forward. In a series of programs, Bill has been sharing his and his wife Glad's remarkable life journey. Today, we're hearing about their time as missionaries in India and the wonderful ways that God used them in ministry, both in Bible teaching and in administering a leprosy hospital. So it sounds like the spiritual teaching part and the administration part of the leprosy hospital, yeah. they kind of worked hand in hand because Absolutely. the one gave you standing in the community? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, the spiritual ministry of teaching, that had its long-term effect because what I taught then rippled out to many other areas. Mm. But my role in the leprosy hospital was to bring in an Indian management because it's something that needed to happen. And God brought into my uh, sphere a chap who was in the Air Force as an administrator. So he became my assistant, and Mm -hmm. eventually I was able to give the whole of the administration over into his hands. I was nominally there. Uh, I was signing the checks, but actually he was doing the work, and and that was this transition because the Indian government by this time was starting to put pressure on us as foreigners. Why why do you need to be here? Mm. When I said, well, we can't find – you tell me where I can find someone who will work with leprosy because, you know, in their thinking, leprosy is a scourge. It's a curse. Mm -hmm. It's their karma. Uh, You don't mess with karma. That's their attitude. Mm -hmm. No one but believers or Christians are doing leprosy work almost anywhere in the world, actually. Mm -hmm. And so we had that standing that we would do what no one else. And and the leprosy mission, I mean, I used to go to the Rotary Club there and give a talk about leprosy. I went to many of the schools and give talks about leprosy. We put on exhibitions in the community mm. and got people to come in. To the, so leprosy was a big thing for mm. us to, to well, talk about. Well, let me ask you a, a question since I know nothing yeah. about leprosy. Weren't yeah. you afraid of catching it? No. But leprosy is rarely ever, if ever, caught by an adult. It's almost always caught in childhood. Hmm. So my children, I took them with me to the hospital. They played with the staff's children, but they would not come down into the area of the hospital. Mm -hmm. As for myself, I used to wash my hands with carbolic soap and and Mm -hmm. that's all I ever need. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica says about leprosy, it's the least contagious of all contagious diseases. Is that right? It does. So people are afraid of it, but really there's only 5% of people with leprosy are contagious. The, the others have yeah. the effects of it, but because they're not really contagious at all. Yeah, in the Bible you're hearing, unclean, unclean. Yeah, you too. But I think in the Bible, especially the Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy parts of leprosy, hmm. are but more a fungusy kind of thing rather oh. than actual the disease. Oh, I'm learning all kinds of things here. That's a fascinating thing for us yeah. to have done. We're, and it gave us huge standing in the, in the mm-hmm. community. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And, and how many years did you serve as a missionary in India? 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we left India mainly because the government was putting pressure on us for a start. Secondly, our children got to a stage where we had to make a decision if we stayed on. And by this time, I had basically handed over the direction of the leprosy hospital. So I really didn't need to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the church itself, we now had church leaders and I didn't really need to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. I could have always stayed and done all this this itinerant work, but I had taught many people who were now teaching others. So I just realized, but there were a couple of things that happened that sort of showed it to me that our time in India was done. And this is what happened. One of our ladies had a cancer and she needed to go back to UK for surgery. To do that, she needed a no objection to return visa, a particular visa that we could get and gave us three months of being able to go out of the country and then come back again with no no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to the city, the big city, which was an overnight train trip, to get her visa so that she could go to England, have a surgery, come back again. So I went and I got the visa very quickly in the big city. 
But then I thought, what am I going to do? So I decided to go to the Bible Society office because they had just published a uh, a new Bible, which today is for us easy, but it was good news for common men. And it was a uh, limited English words, a thousand English words Bible. So I bought a copy, sat in the park and started to read it. Matthew, mm -hmm. Mark, Luke, John. And when I got to John, I came to chapter five. And verse 36 says, the works the Father has given me to finish. Oh, that stood out. Remember when I went to India, it was what I saw in John chapter 20, verse 21, that sent me to India. Mm -hmm. But here is a verse which is saying Jesus came to finish a work, and that stood out to me. Then in chapter 8, chapter 12, the same there until I come to chapter 17. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. And I, I was shocked I went on to the Acts of the Apostles. The Apostle Paul goes on his first missionary journey, and in chapter 14, verse 25, 26, he comes back having finished the work. Mm. And it was standing out to me in that park down there in, in that big city. Hang on. The older missionaries, some of them had been there 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Mm. Jesus did what he had to do in three years. And now I've done what I have to do in, that's how I understood it, I've done what I have to do here in India in 15 years. So I went back to, and I said to Glad, I think the Lord is saying that we're finished mm -hmm. here. And she looked at me and she said, but, but, but. And I said, no, well, I told her. Then I went to one of my Indian friends who was a senior person there and I said, look, I believe God is telling me that our work in India is finished. Now, for myself, from a human point of view, I was in my prime. I was late 30s. I was confident. I had openings here, everywhere. And yet God was saying, you've done it. You're finished, I felt. So what do we do? So Glad and I decided that we would fast and pray. And so we left our home. We went out to a mango grove. We asked permission to sit under mango trees, and we prayed and we read Scripture, and we said, Lord, show us exactly what you want us to do. And so having prayed and that we spent the whole six hours out there, came back home, and would you believe at home there was a letter? And that letter came from a church in Western Australia and it said, if ever you decide to leave India, would you consider coming to be a pastor in our church? Wow, it was like a whole new direction. Now, for our children, it was a critical time. Our older girl was about to go into high school. And the other thing in the church that really troubled me was this. A young person came to me and said, will you pray for me? And I said, of course. Mm -hmm. I said, have you prayed? Oh, no, I don't bother to pray because your prayers are more valuable than mine. Hmm. And I thought to myself, no, that is not good. I'm standing between this person and the Lord, and that's not the role that I want to be. That's wrong. She needs to know that she can directly go and ask the Lord. And so there were these several things, our children's education, these scriptures that were showing me I had finished the work. And so when I went to this Indian man, my friend, my counselor, my mentor, an older Indian man, I said, I think God is telling us. His immediate reaction was, no, brother, no, 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 we need you. And then three days later, he came, he said, do you know, you're absolutely right. It is our job, our responsibility now. We must take up this work. You've done your part, mm -hmm. and now you must go. So we asked the Lord, then what do you want us to do? And that letter came from Perth, and we went there to serve the Lord for a period. But I read on in, in Acts of the Apostles, in chapter 15, Paul says to Silas and Timothy, uh, he actually said to Barnabas as well, come on, let's go back and visit the churches mm -hmm. and encourage them. And that, I believed, was what God was saying to me. Leave India because you've done what you had to do, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you can visit again, this time not as a senior missionary, but just as a teacher of the Bible. You see, I guess I need to say that we were the last in the line of our missionaries because the government would not give any more visas. 
And as a result, I ended up with a whole heap of things to close down. Were we going to close down the leprosy hospital? Mm. Were we going to transfer people? Were we going to do this with that property, mm -hmm. do this with that? So that became a burden for me, which was just too hard to, to bear. Mm -hmm. So now if I went back to India as a Bible teacher, I went with two or three young fellows from Australia who have gone on to be servants for God, gone on into Christian ministry. They, like a poor taking a, a couple of Timothys with me, I took them back to India and their lives have been changed from that. So it was an amazing time. And I look back on India with such fondness. Mm -hmm. And even now, I'm like I'm doing Zoom sermons into India yeah, now. That's fantastic. I, I love it. I love it. I really do. And when did you finally leave India? We left India in September 1978. Oh, okay. So after 15 years there? After 15 years there, and then we came to Perth. We were in Perth for a couple of years. And from there, I would go back to India several times, three mm -hmm. times, four times, taking with me these young fellows from Australia. And then after that, uh, we moved on to Adelaide, and we were in Adelaide for 15 years. Uh, but in that time, many things happened as well that may be a, a, a story for another day. Well, that was Bill Forward talking about his and his wife Glad's time as missionaries in India. I was almost going to call him retired missionary Bill Forward, but as we heard, he's not really retired. As he mentioned, he still teaches the Bible online to students in India, even though he's in his 80s and spends most of his time as Glad's caretaker as she now has Alzheimer's disease. It's great to hear how modern technology allows him to keep on doing what he loves without having to leave his home. Next time, we'll hear more of their story and how their ministry work continues after they return to Australia and how they eventually go overseas again, this time to Romania. All that and more is coming up next time. But before we end today, I just want to share Bill's life verses. They're found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 3 and 4. It says... Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. These verses have guided Bill throughout his life, especially when things didn't seem to make sense at the time. But he knew that God's ways are perfect and that our Lord is just. Whatever happened, he knew he could trust in this. Good advice for all of us. Well, thanks for joining us for part three of Bill and Glad's story, and I'm happy to say there is more to come. We'll hear more about how God leads them in ministry next time. Until then, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. Next time on The Story. So Glad went there and she found these 250 babies there, three to a cot. It was clean, but it was not loving. And she's a loving person and she tried to particularly work with the 18 month old, two years old, even up to the three years old. And it was beautiful for her. The only challenge for me was she'd come home crying and said, can't we adopt a dozen of them? <laughs> Bill Forward joins us once again to share more of his and his wife Glad's story as a couple. We've heard about their time as missionaries in India, helping out at a leprosy hospital and teaching the Bible. Next, we'll hear about their time back in Australia and how they eventually go overseas again, this time to Romania. That's all coming up next time. The Story. The story. Just another way Vision is helping you look to God daily. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.